tonight. We have Anne Lux from Biological Sciences, and I'll leave it up to her. Okay. Thank you. So hopefully everyone is here voluntarily and not under duress. But as you can see, the title of my talk is Fitness, Fat, Fatness, Fractures, Fertility, and Food. Hopefully by the end of the talk, you can see how these variables are linked or not linked. So I'd like to start out with a case study. And it's a case study of a 15-year-old cross-country runner who experiences a hip fracture. Not an unusual event for a 15-year-old cross-country runner. History prior to the fracture was restricted eating, weight loss, amenorrhea, which is absence of menstruation for two years. Four weeks prior to the fracture, she's training. She has progressively worse left anterior hip and groin pain. Next six, three weeks, the pain intensifies and persists through the runs. A week before injury, the pain was constant, and she's developed a limp. On race day, she has significant pain. She consults with her coach. Coach encourages her to run through the pain. She participates in the race. 20 feet from the finish line, she heard a loud crack and fell to the ground. A very serious injury. After the fall, she and her parents were unaware of the injury, waited 24 hours to seek medical care. They consult with their pediatrician who refers her immediately to an orthopedic surgeon. She's diagnosed with a displaced femoral neck stre stress fracture. So this is in the upper part of the thigh bone, the femur. She has surgery with insertion of three titanium screws as we can see. So we can see that fracture, it's being repaired. Five months after the fall, um, the fracture has not healed. She's referred to an osteoporosis center. 12 months after the fall, she continues to lose weight. She was still amenorrheic, still no menstrual cycles, with little evidence of healing. What is going on? As I said, this is not a usual event for a 15-year-old cross-country runner. A um, displaced femoral fracture could occur in a 15-year-old, could occur in a child who's in a serious car accident. A hip fracture could occur in an elderly uh, man or woman who's had 60 or 70 years for bone loss, weakened bone, falls, and the hip fractures. So what I'd like to do over the next 40, 45 minutes is discuss what we have learned with regard to menstrual disorders, skeletal disorders, and what links these disorders, put them into a medical condition which we now label as the female athlete triad that links inadequate nutrition with altered menstrual function, and altered bone. And then we'll look at the origins of this low energy availability in these female athletes. Why would we think of athletes as being typically healthy? Why would they be undernourished? And we'll look at some causes, and then we'll look at some prevention and treatment. So let's first look at menstrual disorders. All types of menstrual disorders or function in general population also occurs in athletes. So athletes can be, have very regular menstrual cycles, which they're regularly menstruating, they're ovulating, those cycles are occurring. Regular usually means 25 to 35 days. But they also can have asymptomatic clinical disorders. These could be long cycles, which we describe as oligomenorrhea, short cycles, are the complete absence of menstruation. They're not ovulating, they're not menstruating, and this is what we term amenorrhea. Now, in the general population of young women, absence of menstruation occurs in about three to five percent of young women. In long distance runners who are 
have a gynecological age. Gynecological age is the number of years since the first menstrual cycle. So if you stop at, start at age 12 or 13, we're talking about women in their late 20s, early 30s, up to 30% of them are not menstruating. This is much higher in younger women. Some studies indicating it's as high as 65% have stopped menstruating. But we can also have subclinical asymptomatic menstrual cycles. So these symptomatic women know if they have short cycles, if they have long cycles, they know if they're not menstruating. But subclinical asymptomatic, they have their eumenorrhea, they menstruate on very regular intervals. But we only, through looking in the blood or the urine, we can detect further alterations. And we can have a condition that we call luteal suppression. This is ovulation that's occurring in the mid-cycle of the menstrual cycle uh, with menses, but without enough progesterone being produced by the ovary to maintain the lining of the uterus to support a pregnancy. This could be lead to infertility. We can have an ovulation, menses that's occurring without ovulation um, or luteal function. Now, in the general population, this occurs at a rate of about 10%. In long-distance runners, it may occur as often as 78%. In women that are active, not necessarily long-distance runners, but active, it's been reported to be as high as 25%. Definitely higher than what we see in the general population. Now, if we look at what have we learned with regard to where is this disruption occurring um, related to the exercise and the diet, the reproductive system is regulated by the hypothalamic anterior pituitary and the end organ. It's the ovary and the male. It would be the end organ would be the testes. So at the level of the hypothalamus in the brain, we have GnRH neurons that are producing GnRH. They're carried into a portal system where they stimulate the anterior pituitary gland to produce luteinizing hormone shown here, or as well as FSH. Those hormones stimulate the ovary to produce estrogen and progesterone. They also stimulate the selection, maturation, and release of an egg once a month in a regularly menstruating woman. Those estrogens and progesterones feed back to uh, regulate the hypothalamus and the pituitary. In the male, we would have hypothalamus, pituitary, GnRH, LH, FSH, but in the testes, we would have primarily testosterone being produced as well as sperm. What's also very important, in, in addition to these hormones being produced and acting at these glands, is the pattern at which they're released. So if we were to look at GnRH or LH over time, so the x-axis represents time, 24 hours, we would see those hormones are fluctuating. That is due to the fact they're released from the gland in bursts. And that burst activity, that frequency, is very important for optimum regulation. Now, early in my career, I felt to look at this problem, I really needed to compare these pulse patterns in athletes and non-athletes. So I recruited a group of regularly menstruating, habitually sedentary women that I label cyclic sedentary. We admitted them into a, hos a research unit in a hospital. We inserted a catheter line into a vein. We drew blood samples every 20 minutes for 12 hours, followed by every 10 minutes for 12 hours. And we did this, when we did this in the early follicular phase, right after they started menstruating, a time at which estrogen is low, progesterone is low. We see a pattern here that we describe as high frequency, low amplitude. We recruited a group of cyclic athletes, amenorrheic athletes. These were primarily runners, triathletes. And what we found is the cyclic athletes, they menstruated every 28 days, just like the sedentary women. But what you see is fewer pulses occurring in those women than the sedentary women. And if we look at the amenorrheic women, they have even fewer pulses occurring at irregular intervals. But what we also see is if we plotted all that data together, the average sample, average concentration is about 10, is very is similar in those groups. So a single blood sample wouldn't distinguish them. It's only the pulsatility that allowed us to distinguish them. 
After these women left the hospital, um, they connect, collected overnight urine samples. In those urine samples, we looked at estrogen and progesterone metabolites in the urine. And this is a typical pattern we would see for a regularly menstruating woman. The top shows estrogen, the bottom shows progesterone, zero. The data is all plotted around the time of ovulation, which we label as zero. So this, and what we see with the regularly menstruating runners and triathletes, estrogen is virtually identical. But what we see in the um, progesterone shown in the bottom, in this orange, is that there's about 50% of the um, progesterone is being produced in those women, and they've got a shortened luteal phase. That's what we refer to as luteal suppression. Now, if that's extreme enough, these women could not support a pregnancy. So this could be a problem. But what we further see is the alteration in the amenorrheic women. They're not menstruating. They're not ovulating. They're locked into low levels of estrogen and progesterone production on a daily basis. And this low estrogen is one of the problems for their bone. So they're like postmenopausal women with regard to these low estrogen levels that is detrimental to the bone. Now, we, our lab and other labs wanted to know is the level of the disturbance occurring at the hypothalamus in the brain or is it occurring at the pituitary? So we administered GNRH and pituitary is fine. So the problem is in the hypothalamus. We refer to this as hypothalamic amenorrhea. And our question has been, what in exercise is affecting that extra hypothalamic input that would affect neurotransmitters, that it would affect that hypothalamic um, regulation? Is it something in the diet? Is it something in the exercise? What are they doing that's causing that disturbance? So let's look what we found with skeletal disorders in athletes. And what we see if we look at bone mass as women age is that from childhood through adolescent years, we see an increase in bone mass. It peaks um, mid-late 20s, and then there is an aging decline that accelerates at the time of menopause when estradiol levels drop. Um, we define postmenopausal osteoporosis, osteoporosis being the loss of bone mineral density, tending to weight, make that bone less strong, more prone to fracture. And we define that by looking at T-scores, relative number of standard deviations that the bone has declined relative to those peak levels we would see in the very early 30s. But what we also see is that premenopausal osteoporosis in these adolescent women in their young 20 is diagnosed relative to bone mass at the same age because these individuals haven't reached their peak bone mass. So we use a Z-score to characterize their bone density relative to their age. And so a adolescent could be developing osteoporosis while bone mass is increasing. So it's appropriate to use the Z-score with regard to them. Now this is a study done um, in Southern California taking a large group of high school athletes and they looked at them at one point in time. So this is a cross-sectional data set comparing the 13-year-olds, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18-year-olds with regard to bone mineral density looking at Z-scores now and we're looking in the lumbar spine. And what we see is that um, we're comparing runners in the red to non-runners. Now, these non-runners were all athletes, but they're doing different types of things. Some of them were lacrosse, some of them were soccer, some of them were volleyball, some were swimmers, um, a variety of sports. And what you can see is, compared to the runners, they're, they're not distinguishable at 13, 14, but by 15, 16, the Runners are about half of a standard deviation of a Z-score low. And then by 17 to 18 years, where those non-runners have accumulated benefits we'd expect from exercise of mechanical loading. Their Z-scores are about one um, 
standard deviation higher than age-matched sedentary individuals. So they're gaining benefits, but these runners are about one standard deviation z-score low. These same runners that were low were followed for another three years to see if they did have catch-up. Did they accumulate bone mineral density? And they did not. So there is concern about them. We also see the importance of the menstrual cycle in terms of regularity with a study that was done by Lloyd and colleagues in which they took a group of adolescent girls and they followed them, tracked the number of menstrual cycles they had from the first menstrual cycle at age 12 or 13 to 19 years of age. And then this data is plotting the number of mens cycles, the number of missed menstrual cycles during that six or seven year period relative to bone mineral density. And what we see is that those girls that had missed more than 40 menstrual cycles had 30% less bone mineral density. Presumably, those missed menstrual cycles meant less estrogen exposure to the bone and less opportunity to acquire um, the bone mineral density for those individuals. We also have a study looking at fractures. This was studied this reported this fall out of Harvard. And this is looking at a group of amenorrheic athletes, eumenorrheic athletes, non-athletes, with how many fractures had they experienced in their lifetime. Now, these are young women, average age, 19 years. What we see is that amenorrheic women, by 19 years, 47% of them have had some type of fracture. Um, what we also see, though, is the non-athletes, we have different types of stress, stress fractures reported here. So non-athletes were in this darker gray, we're looking at non-stress fractures. And so 12.5% compared to 17.1, compared to 15 of non-stress fractures, not very different across those groups. Children and adolescents fracture. How many people had a fracture before the age of 20? People fracture, so children fracture. But what is unusual about this group, amenorrhea, 27% of them had a stress fracture compared to zero for the non-athletes, 2.9 for the eumenorrheic athletes. So what is causing a stress fracture? Fractures, um, these stress fractures result from repeated loads much smaller than the um, single load required to break a bone. Every day, all of us, if we're moving around, experience millions of micro cracks caused by routine loading. So all of us who have been moving around today throughout our skeleton, we've experienced some micro cracks. Increased loading, if we're doing more moving around, um, increasing that loading, we're going to have an increased micro crack production. Now, microcracks are healed. The body goes through remodeling processes, which are healthy processes to repair that bone. So at a site of a microcrack, we would expect osteoclast cells to migrate to that site. They're going to erode some um, of the collagen and mineral, makes up that bone, and release that. That's going to be followed by some osteoblast cells that are going to migrate to those si sites and replace, stimulate some processes that will replenish the mineral, replenish the collagen. If those are in sync, then we've repaired the microcrack. But we can think of stress fractures as a competition between the rate at which we're moving around, creating these microcracks, and healing. So if production is faster, microcracks are cu accumulating, we think they link up, become painful, and they link up and form a stress fracture. So what was probably occurring in that first case study is she was, de she was developing a, a stress fracture, but she kept running training through that stress fracture. Now the one interesting thing about that 15-year-old that I showed you the case study is the fact that her Z-scores for her bone were normal. So bone mineral density is not telling us everything about the bone. So what causes these disorders? Now, early hypotheses is that it simply can be explained by low body fat. 
And if you didn't know anything about this area, you might have thought this is simply low body fat. That's a very common explanation for this disruption. But what we find, in fact, is that amenorrheic and eumenorrheic runners are not distinguished by body fat. Very few studies have found the amenorrheic women leaner. Now, these athletes are often leaner than sedentary women, but the, um, the amenorrheic women are not necessarily leaner. We have a vast amount of um, literature on mammals and some on humans in which we've manipulated nutrition and we see a change in the reproduction far sooner than the body fat changes. So we don't think body fat is the mechanism of the disturbance. But it is confusing because often with undernutrition you become lean and what you see is a lean individual. Other theories, we thought that exercise would stimulate um, prolactin or stimulate androgens during the run. We know that high prolactin, like we thought was like nursing mothers, lactating mothers have high levels of prolactin, they're amenorrheic. But what we in fact find is that um, after those training bouts and at rest, prolactin levels are not high in the menorrheic women. Um, high androgens can inhibit the reproductive system, but for this mechanism in these amenorrheic athletes, they have low, not high androgens. So that's not a viable mechanism. However, exercise stress Amenorrheic athletes do have high levels of cortisol, known as the stress hormone. They have high levels of cortisol after an exercise bout. They have high levels of cortisol um, at rest. That uh, remained a possible mechanism. Could it be like, could it be energy deficiency like starvation? Amenorrheic athletes have abnormal levels of metabolic substrates and hormones characteristic of starvation. The regularly menstruating athletes, the eumenorrheic women that have this luteal suppression, they also have alterations of metabolic hormones and substrates that are similar to starvation, but it's not as severe as the amenorrheic women. So that re remained a candidate. So by 1990, I felt the hypothesis about the menstrual disorders and skeletal disorders were reduced to two. And so I thought the exercise stress might be disrupting LH pulsatility or the possibility it's undernourishment and these athletes just need to eat more. But to answer those two questions, I felt I couldn't study athletes. There wasn't any more I could do to study athletes because these changes in them had already occurred. I was going to really have to do true experiments and take regularly menstruating non-athletes who were adequately nourished and put them through training programs with exercise, manipulate their diet with regard to the amount of energy and nutrition we provided them and see what had an impact on the reproductive system. So the next 20 years, we investigated these hypotheses in a series of experiments which we titled the Excalibur experiments here at Ohio University. And so what I want to do um, is highlight three of those experiments. They all have been useful, they all have been very informative, but I want to highlight three that I think are important for our discussion today. So if we were to look at energy and exercise stress, we had to develop some definitions of what we're talking about. And so with regard to energy availability, it's important to realize that dietary energy, calories we consume in our diet, we're going to channel it into different functions which we need um, to operate the body. Cellular maintenance, thermoregulation, immune function, growth, reproduction, and locomotion. Energy use for one, locomotion or exercise is not available for the other. So in our experiments, we define energy availability as dietary energy intake minus all those calories that are expended with exercise. So that would leave energy availability that would be available for all those other functions. Now, with exercise stress, we felt despite 70 years of research into the physiological responses to exercise stress, there was still no objective definition of exercise stress itself. So we defined it 
as everything associated with exercise except the exercise energy expenditure. So by using those definitions, we could create a two-by-two two design where we had high and low levels of exercise stress and high and low levels of energy availability. And our exercise has been done in the laboratory where we could put, mostly on the treadmill, but not always, so we could put people on a mouthpiece, connect them to a metabolic cart where we could measure how many calories are they expending. We, for many of our studies, we used Ross Laboratories Ensure so that we knew how many calories we were feeding individuals, and then we knew the proportions of fats, carbohydrate, and protein. And then for our studies that we, our outcome variable was primarily LH pulsatility. We administered that training for, uh, many of our studies were either four or five or six days in duration. We did those exercises and um, diet manipulations while individuals were in Athens. And then on the last day of exercise, they would exercise here. We'd drive up to Columbus. They would be admitted into a research unit in Ohio University Hospital where we could have a catheter line inserted into a vein in their arm and we could draw blood samples at 10 minute intervals for 24 hours. So it was, um, we required a lot of cooperation for the subjects. Again, we're selecting habitually sedentary women who are not dieting, who have very regular menstrual cycles for these studies. And what did we find? We found in Excalibur 3 that LH pulsatility was disrupted by low energy availability due to reduced dietary in intake. So we had a sedentary group that we just fed a low amount of calories on each of four days. We looked at the pulsatility. It was decreased. We also fed women normally, but we had them do a half marathon of exercise to put them in a deprived state LH pulsatility decreased. And we had um, a combination, which we think is something that women may actually, some of these athletes may be doing, half deprived with the diet and half deprived by doing the exercise. LH pulsatility decreased. But exercise had no disruptive effect beyond the impact of the energy cost. So if we had these women do a half marathon on each of four days, we fed all those calories back, no change in LH pulsatility. So that led us to think the disruption can be prevented by dietary supplementation in compensation for that exercise energy expenditure. That was a really big finding because it meant that these athletes could do all the exercise as long as they were willing to eat. And before this, we didn't know. And some people actually didn't think this was such a great idea to study. Women had worked hard with Title IX to get the allowance to participate and compete in sport. And they thought if we find thresholds for women, that's going to be problematic. Fortunately, we found they can do all that exercise if they're willing to eat. I haven't had any questions. I haven't had any, any interruptions. Am I clear? Or do we have any questions at this point? For a, a stress fracture to heal or a microcrack? A microcrack is going to actually take probably months to go through the whole completion process. There's days at which those osteoclasts are eroding followed by days and weeks, the osteoblast, but the final completion can take weeks or possibly months. So if you have millions Did you say billions or millions? Okay, yes. Yeah? <laughs> okay. The question is, if we're having these million micro cracks, finish the question. Yes, you're, you're constantly, be, the bodily, body is constantly remodeling as a healing process. So th but that's a very important concept because one of the drugs we have for treating osteoporosis is to inhibit remodeling. 
So you can imagine if we have a healthy process we're trying to repair, that that drug, there's a side effect of that drug that we've shut down remodeling. We don't, th the, question, the question is hydration a problem with the disturbance. We don't think the hydration is a problem with the disturbance, but certainly hydration is important for people that are exercising. But we don't have any evidence to indicate hydration is part of the mechanism of the disturbance at this point. Um, we, that's one thing that we didn't standardize is the fluid intake. So the honest answer is I don't precisely know, but we don't have any endocrine mechanisms that would lead us to go down that path. But we did, we looked at a lot of variables, we controlled a lot of variables, but hydration was not one of them. Yes. Okay, the question is about strength training, especially CrossFit. We have not pursued strength training itself. Most of all of our work where we're trying to, um, in these experiments, we've tried to impose exercise that we knew would be result in a lot of energy deficit. But I will speak, the very last experiment, Excalibur 11, um, that we actually did in men, we did some drop landings, but those are not quite resistance training. So I'll talk about that. In, in these studies, Excalibur 3 and then the next study, Excalibur 5, um, we kept our, we were manipulating the energy other studies, we started manipulating carbohydrate and fat. <laughs> In the athletes that I studied? Yeah. Uh, there were not... The question was their physical contact sports and those other athletes. And um, there were not, but I think that was because they were taken from high schools in Southern California. And it, I don't know that any type of contact sport was available to those athletes. Okay. At what? Well, we acquire about 90% of your skeleton is acquired about age 19 or 20. And then by late 20s, early 30s, th that is when you reach peak bone mass, classically. Okay. Yes. We think mechanical loading, proper nutrition, adequate calcium, vitamin D, and mechanical loading of keeping active. In our experiments, in the, the question did they lose too much weight in our, in our experiments. In our experiments, we're keeping it very short. As I said, most of them have been four, five, or six days in duration. So we are seeing some weight loss, but we've also monitored them after the study when they go back to their normal diet, and, are, um, and they, that, they quickly gain that back.
The question, are we seeing stinted, stunted stature? To my knowledge, that's not been reported. We are seeing altered bone, amounts of bone mineral density. There is efforts to look at what in that bone is being altered. Is it the trabecular or the cortical? But that's, we, we don't have a lot of data on that. So in Excalibur 5, we wanted to ask the question, how much energy availability is needed to maintain normal LH pulsatility in exercising women? So where does this threshold occur when we would start to see a change? And so for that experiment, I'm going to show you the design. And what we have on the x-axis is energy availability. And each of these boxes would represent the treatment groups that we utilized in that study. So all the participants were studied at what we considered energy balance, which is 45 kilocalories per kg fat-free mass per day. So we're normalizing for body size. We're normalizing for the more metabolically active tissue, the fat-free mass. And 45 for our um, average woman who was about 130 pounds, 25% body fat. That was, if she did no exercise at all, that would be two th an intake of 2,000 calories. Um, so each woman was studied for five days at 45, and then either at 30, 20, or 10. And in this study, to achieve those energy availabilities, we standardized the volume of exercise. So they're coming in and expending 15 kilocalories per kg fat-free mass per day, which was about 90 minutes of exercise, primarily on the treadmill at a moderate workload. And so to achieve different energy availabilities than the amount of calories they were fed did vary. And I'll show you typical pulse patterns that we saw. And this is a woman studied after five days at 45. You can see that high frequency, low amplitude pulse pattern and after five days at 30, and you see no change. So we've deprived the system by a third. Pulsatility has not changed. Now, one thing that we had to control is because estrogen and progesterone feed back to affect that pulse generator in the hypothalamus, we had to standardize the phase of the menstrual cycle that the subjects, we did the studies. So we had about a two or three day window um, after they started menstruating at the beginning of the cycle for them to start the exercise. So this was really a lot of cooperation on the part of the subjects because they had to call us, I started, we schedule their exercise, they're going to do the five days of exercise. On the fifth day they do the exercise in the morning, we drive up to Columbus, we insert the catheter line, we're starting the blood sampling at 1500, 3 o'clock in the afternoon and we go till 1500 the next day. That's two days of missed class. Um, then we had to repeat it because they had to do another treatment. So we wait two months because we're drawing a unit of blood. So it's a lot of cooperation on the part of the participants to be in the study. So we deprive by a third. We see no change. We deprive by more than half. You're starting to see fewer pulses. You're starting to see an increase in amplitude. And we deprive down to our most severe level, we clearly see we've slowed down the pulse generator. We clearly see an increase in amplitude. We clearly have an effect within five days. We plot all that data together. And so now we're looking at percent. We're averaging the values, changes that we've seen in each individual relative to 45. And what we see is that Frequency from 45 to 30, no change. Once we go below 30, we see a um, decreased number of pulses, slowing down a pulse frequency and an increase in pulse amplitude. So what does that mean? What that means is we, the threshold appears to be at 30. And 30 happens to be resting metabolic rate, the amount of energy we need for um, sleeping and for very, very low activity. So what we think is going on is that once you're below that threshold of 30, the body starts to shut down physiological systems which are not necessary for the individual survival. Reproduction is one of them. 
We th and what we'd like to know are other systems like growth, growth of bone, growth of muscle, also shut down, and what are those thresholds that they might be shut down? The good news is that 45 to 30, that is a range at which if women are wanting to lose weight, that's a safe zone. The unsafe zone is below 30 because the reproductive system is going to start to shut down. Now, we did this study in men. The threshold is the same for men. So based on this study and other studies that have done refeeding and amenorrheic athletes and finding the threshold of 30 appears to be holding up, the key to preventing amenorrhea, as best we know now, is to keep this energy availability above 30. This was also another big finding. So we also wanted to see what was going on with the bone when we did this experiment. We're not going to see a change in bone mineral density in five days. That would take months to see that change. But what we could look at is bone markers. These markers are indicator of this bone turnover that's occurring with these microcracks. We could look at those in blood and urine. And so we looked at um, a marker of bone resorption. And what we're plotting here is relative to the energy availability. What we see is NTX went up at our most severe energy availability of 10 when estradiol declined. But we also found that bone formation, these bone formation markers, changed at uh, much higher energy availabilities. So effects on collagen, as indicated by PICP, paralleled the declines we saw in insulin. Effects on calcium binding, osteocalcin binds the mineral to the collagen. Those effects paralleled declines in T3 and IGF-1. So we could see these effects in five days. So our model of what we think is going on is that the mechanism of bone moss, in normal bone balance, where we have a microcrack, we think that there are these osteoclast cells that migrate to that uh, microcrack. They erode the bone, releasing um, the collagen, releasing mineral, and they erode a hole, as indicated by that area in white. Osteoblast cells then migrate, and they refill the hole. So if we're in good normal balance, the erosion is matched by the formation, and we're in normal bone balance. Postmenopausal osteoporosis, we have osteoclast mediated bone loss. Those low estrogen is increasing the size of the resorption. Osteoclast cells have receptors for estradiol. When estradiol levels drop, that inhibition of those osteoclasts is gone. So those osteoclast cells become more active and resorption is increased. Formation is the same as normal bone balance, but we have loss of um, bone due to increased resorption. Now, we can have osteoblast-mediated bone loss, the poor nutrition leading to alterations of metabolic hormones, low insulin, T3, IGF-1, is leading to low bone formation, decreased size of the pink. So what we think is going on in this female athlete triad is both things are going on. They have low estrogen, so they have osteoclast-mediated bone loss, but they also have poor nutrition, leading to alterations of these um, metabolic hormones that are decreasing the, sorry, decreasing the size of that replenishment. For many years, the standard of care for these, women, these amenorrheic athletes has to been put them on birth control pills. We thought it was like postmenopausal osteoporosis. We put them on a form of estrogen. That's not been completely successful, but we've treated half the problem. Another problem with putting them on birth control pills is they thought they were treated. They're taking the pill, I'm treated, no need to change their nutrition. So the standard of care is to improve the nutrition. So 
In Excalibur 11, we wanted to get back to these stress fractures. And the most common site of a stress fracture um, in the tibia is the junction between the middle and distal third of the tibia. So if we take a MRI image of the tibia, which is what I'm showing you here, and the tibia is outlined here in black, um, what we find is that microcracks accumulation causes edema on the marrow on the inside of that bone. So before we would get a stress fracture, there's inflammation at that site, and that site results in edema or pooling of liquid. And so this is visible on magnetic resident images. So if we did MRIs of the tibia before and after exercise, we could look at was there increased brightening. So here we see, shown in green, in that marrow, we see increased brightening. That would be signs of inflammation, signs of a microcrack. A, a stress fracture is not developed. What you also see is brighter green. That's due to fluid in the blood vessels. So that brighter green that we're seeing in that scan, we're taking a scan, a scan of the lower leg, a coronal slice, um, to look at that whole lower leg and look at that tibia. And so that other green we're seeing is blood vessels. So we did an experiment in which we um, brought the subjects over to Oblenis. We did a um, uh, MRI scan of the tibia before and after eight days of exercise treatment. And we did eight days of intense exercise by 14 habitually sedentary men. Um, some of these men did were walking on a treadmill, 12,000 steps a day for each of eight days. The other men were stepping off a platform and dropping to the ground 400 times a day. That's a drop landing to create a lot of mechanical um, force that would create hopefully some edema but not create a stress fracture. Before and after, athletic trainer um, palpated the legs how the athletic trainer didn't pick up any signs of any problems. All of the subjects did not experience any discomfort. We did not develop a stress fracture in eight days. We would expect probably two or three weeks for that to occur. But in eight days, we could see the preliminary signs of inflammation with this fluid. But what we also found is when we administered the treatment, so we did eight days at an energy availability of 45, and then eight days at a low energy availability of 20, um, randomizing the order, and we had a, a long washout period so that the tibias would all recover, is we found low energy availability tripled the amount of marrow edema. So the low energy availability is a process here. What we also thought through this paradigm um, that we used is we had actually it's, it was very useful for seeing what low energy availability may do, but it may also be very useful for trying to study mechanisms of stress fractures, because there's lots of theories of what is causing it, but we think we may have found a paradigm by looking at this edema that would be helpful to use in other studies. So what do we know about, what, how do we classify this female athlete triad? And so what we've done is we think populations of athletes is distributed along these three variables of energy availability, menstrual function, and bone mineral density. So at one end of all of those parameters, we, on the far right, we have a very healthy level of all those parameters. On the far left, we have unhealthy levels of those parameters. And we think that all um, female athletes are somewhere on each of those lines and they may, energy availability may fluctuate on a daily basis. Menstrual function may take weeks to change. Bone mineral density may take months to change. But what we can also say is that we think these are linked by mechanisms, endocrine mechanisms, so that low energy availability is changing this LH pulsatility that would eventually lead to decreased estradiol, which is decreasing or increasing osteoclast activity Low energy availability is affecting these metabolic uh, hormones, which are also affecting bone formation. So we have a model by which these parameters could be linked. 
So what are the consequences of the triad? Um, short term, there are some other consequences that I haven't talked about. In the short term, if these women are undernourished, they are not going to be able to successfully glycogen load. And glycogen loading is important for training for many athletes, training for a long distance. They want to supercompensate with glycogen. Initial findings compared men, uh, women and men, and they concluded that the women were physiologically different than the men because they couldn't glycogen load. But when they fed the women as much as they fed the men, there was no physiological difference. We have a few studies showing altered performance when they're undernourished, so that is a problem. Uh, when these women are amenorrheic, they're infertile. The good news is if their nutrition improves, this appears to be reversible. So the fertility is not as serious a concern if they will improve their nutrition. The more serious concern is the skeleton. Adolescents, they may be failing to accumulate bone mass. 80% of our skeleton is genetically determined. That other 20% is determined by amount of mechanical loading we're doing, healthiness of the diet in terms of adequate energy, calcium, and vitamin D. The time to accumulate half of our skeleton is laid down during those adolescent years. These women may be losing that opportunity. Adults, loss of bone mass, increased risk of stress fractures. In the long term, is, are these women on a track for an early risk of postmenopausal osteoporotic fractures. That is the fear that the bone cannot recover and that they may be experiencing more serious fractures at a much earlier age. So the American College of Sports Medicine um, has developed two position stands on the female athlete triad. Uh, 19, one was published in 1997, one is 2007. And I'd like to emphasize that in, those first, in the first sentences of those documents, because the benefits of exercise far outweigh the risks, the American College of Sports Medicine encourages all girls and women to participate in physical activities and sport. So I don't want you to leave this talk thinking that exercise is not beneficial. It is very beneficial, but low energy availability with or without eating disorders, functional hypothalamic amenorrhea, and osteoporosis alone or in combination pose significant risk in physically active girls and women. Um, therefore, prevention, recognition, and treatment of these conditions should be a pr priority for those who are working with female athletes to ensure they maximize the benefits of exercise. So there may be limits at which, in which action has to be taken with regard to um, removing women from participating and treating these like injuries. So, why are they under eating? What are some explanations for that? Um, one explanation is an effort to improve performance by modifying body size and body composition. And reducing body weight and body fat are their common goals for athletes to try to improve their performance. But its pursuit of these goals needs to be managed by sport nutritionists. From what we know, we need to keep that energy availability above 30. And it's also important that these women, although 30 to 45 might be a safe zone for dieting, it should be a tactic that's periodically used and not a lifestyle for these women. There can be efforts to improve appearance by modifying size and body composition. More young female athletes report improvement of appearance than improvement of performance as a reason for dieting. And there could be a reason outside of athletics that differentiates the, wi the way men and women view themselves. There was a study done, excess of 18,000 students, 22 countries, all continents around the world, and they asked these college students two questions. Do you perceive yourself as being overweight? And they divided looked at the data relative to the women shown in black, the men shown in diamonds, and then they divided the data based on BMI. BMI, an indicator of body fatness, the leanest BMIs on the far left, the highest BMIs on the far right. And what you can see is that worldwide, regardless of BMI, whether you're very lean 
are fatter, about twice as many women as men perceive themselves as being overweight, whether they are very lean or much fatter. But this, perfect, this perception affects their eating behavior. They ask them the second question, are you trying to lose weight? And the leaner the women are, the more they differ from men in trying to lose weight. At those highest BMIs, 1.3 to two times as many women stating they're trying to lose weight. But those very leanest individuals, six to nine times as many women are trying to lose weight despite the fact they're very lean. Where would our endurance athletes be and our aesthetic athletes? They would be down at that very leanest level. There can be restrictive eating disorders. Um, eating disorders are clinical mental illnesses with the highest mortality rates of all mental illnesses. Restrictive eating order, disorders such as anorexia nervosa are the chief concern. And women with anorexia may actually self-select into endurance and aesthetic sports in which low body weight is a competitive advantage. And in some of those sports, they may be, there's a lot of reinforcement to be as lean as possible. So the treatment for these is psychiatry. Coaches, trainers, and dietitians are not competent to administer it. Um, all sport programs should have procedures for detecting these athletes, referring them for medical care, restricting their participation until they receive medical clearance. The standard of care is to treat those like injuries and remove them and get them care until they hopefully improve. But a fourth reason is probably underappreciated, and that is that there may be appetite suppression. Well, exercise and high-carbohydrate diets recommended to these athletes suppress appetite. Appetite regulatory centers are in the hypothalamus of the brain, and high exercise and high-carbohydrate, they suppress appetite, and the effects are additive. So, Appetite's not a reliable indicator of the energy requirements for these athletes. S sport programs need professional dietitians to train them to eat by discipline, planned amounts at planned times. So where are we with prevention and treatment? Um, as I said, the primary aim at this point in time is um, increase energy availability. Key to modification is to um, raise that above 30. Treatment with oral contraceptives does not correct the metabolic abnormalities, and so we are stressing the importance of improving energy availability. Guidelines, we have the American College of Sports Medicine guidelines, published in 2007. In 2014, we have a, um, a female athlete triad coalition that is a group of scientists and sport physicians, sport nutritionists, and we came out with guidelines entitled Treatment and Return to Play. This is modeled after the concussion guidelines for return to play in sport, in which we are actually looking at athletes in terms of menstrual status and problems with their bone and removing them from training, removing them from competition until their medical condition improves. So we're treating it like an injury. So I have Lots of people to thank that have helped with those studies, co-investigators, um, medical consultants, Deb Murray as a nutritional consultant, uh, postdoctor fellows that have worked on this, medical students, Tim Law, who started out in my lab as a medical student who is now a physician in the medical school, graduate students, um, a large group of undergraduate students, and lab technicians who have worked extremely hard to um, collect these data for these studies, uh, hospitals, medical services, Ohio State University Hospital, GCRC, Oblenis Hospital, Radiology Associates, our funding, American Heart Association, National Institute of Child Health and Development, Department of Defense, Abbott Labs, and the hundreds of volunteers and participants who have come into our lab and done some very rigorous experiments. And I am now ready to take any questions that you may have. Uh, 
Not all sports programs have that available, but the recommendation is that they develop those programs so that we are treating them like injuries. Okay. Yes. Um, it was, well, we always wanted to see whether there was going to be a difference between the men and the women. And, um, we, so, um, we always wanted to do men and women. <laughs>